Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, we continue talking about uh, structure of atom. Um, now, previous lecture was just kind of a historical essay, I would say. Um, there are many different uh, people who participated um, in basically contemporary view uh, on the atom structure. And uh, it's not finished. I mean, it's still continuing. There are certain details which are still coming up. But we are not talking about contemporary level of this knowledge. Uh, we are going back to end of 19th century, maybe beginning of the 20th century. That will probably would be the next lecture. Um, and we will basically talk about how people progressed in their knowledge about atom. This lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens presented at Unizor.com. If you found the video for this lecture somewhere on YouTube or somewhere else, um, well, you will have th just this particular video, obviously, um, but if you will go to the website, all the videos and um, textual presentation which accompanies every lecture are organized into a course. So there is a menu, there are chapters, if you wish, uh, topics, and um, it goes progressively from one topic to another, and I'm always using something which I have already covered before in the subsequent lecture. So I do recommend you to go to unizor.com and watch this and every other lecture from there and read the textual um, notes for every lecture, which is basically like a textbook. Um, the site is completely free, by the way. There are no advertisement, no strings attached, so pure knowledge, use it as well. Right, so we are right now at the end of 19th century, like 1880 something, 82 maybe. Um, people did know at that time about electromagnetic fields. Maxwell equations have already been published and generally accepted. So light is the oscillations of electromagnetic field. That was the general opinion um, at that time. And people were actually uh, studying how light behaves under different circumstances. One of the very important uh, experiments which basically led to some kind of atomic structure was um, examining the light emitted by hydrogen when it's um, activated in some way, like for instance you have electricity uh, or, or heat or something like this, when you are agitating the atoms of um, hydrogen, it emits light. Well, as many other things, if you have a piece of iron and, and start heating it up, eventually it will start glowing red, right? Okay, so light is emitted when, well, we can say right now that electrons are agitated and their movement within the atomic structure actually causes this particular effect of glowing. So, um, people were studying the uh, very simple, the simplest atom of hydrogen and uh, they were knowledgeable enough to understand that the light can be spread into a spectrum and by that time, uh, many experimental physicists have uh, uncovered what kind of light actually, what kind of components of the light emitted by um, uh, hydrogen um, do exist. And they could even measure the wavelengths. Um, so at that time, uh, people basically came up with certain experiments which gave concrete wavelengths 
of the light emitted by hydrogen. And it wasn't just one particular monochromatic light, it was a few. So, first uh, was um, Johann Balmer, who basically measured the wavelengths of the uh, different components of a spectrum emitted by hydrogen when it's agitated in some way, like heated, for, for example. And he had numbers. Numbers were the wavelengths. So let me just give a few of them. I have it written here. 656 nanometers, 486, 434, 410. 397, 389, and 383. These were just few spectrum um, lights, which spectrum components. These are wavelengths of certain uh, lights emitted by um, agitated hydrogen, heated or electrified, whatever. And uh, they correspond to certain colors. I think this one is red. This is something like, I don't remember, maybe cyan. These are definitely violet. And these are all violet. I'm not sure about this one. <coughs> now, experiment is one thing, but the theory the real physical theory is another. So what was the first step when you have certain number of numbers which you don't know why they are this particular way? I mean, the theory actually, the real theory, came up much later. That was at the time of Bohr atom, uh, at atoms model, which will be the subject of the next lecture. And that's the 20th century, beginning of 20th century. But at that time, 1880-something, people just had these numbers. They did not real, really know about planetary um, uh, model of atom and electrons jumping from one uh, orbit to another, emitting certain amount of energy as electromagnetic oscillations, light. So at that time, they didn't really know. But they had to build the theory. So what the first thing which com comes up is to have some kind of a formula which well which basically combines these uh, numbers together and then if there is such a formula to be able to maybe explain why is such and such um, I'm not sure but quite probable some very known formulas like for for example the newton's gravity formula um, maybe they people came up with this formula before they actually uh, explained why this particular formula is what it is so in many cases and this is one of the examples people have decided to first let me come up with some kind of a formula which combines these numbers and then I'll think about how to explain it. So Balmer um, was the one who basically combined these numbers into formula which he himself came up with and quite frankly I don't know how he came up with this formula because it's not that simple. It's simple but not very simple. It's not like y is equal to x squared or something like this. It's a little bit more complex. I'll write it down. Um, anyway, he came up with this formula. He was probably thinking a lot about this. He was not really explaining why this formula describes exactly these particular numbers. But anyway, he managed to come up with this formula and it looks like this. Lambda, which is this, equals some kind of a constant n squared divided by n squared minus 4 where this is 
n equals 3, this is n equals 4, this is n equals 5, n equals 6, n equals 7, n equals 8, and n equals 9. So if you substitute n's into this formula, where b is approximately 364 to 64.5 nanometers. So if you will substitute this into this formula, you will get these numbers, where b is a constant. I checked. <laughs> yes, it does correspond. So this was a Balmer's formula, and again, he did not really explain why. And let me just jump a little bit forward. Now, since we were talking about planetary model of atom, I can say that n is actually the orbit number. Now, um, this is also orbit number. It's not really 4. It's 2 square. Yeah, 2 square is 4, right? But 2 is orbit number for an electron to jump 2. And n is a number electron jumps from. So from 3rd to 2nd, that would be the light emitted um, by this particular jump. If electron jumps to the 2nd level from number 4, you will get corresponding uh, light of different wavelengths. So it's all, it all depends on the difference in energy levels on level, let's say, 3 and level 2. So the energy level is uh, the one which quant of energy is emitted. And again, you remember uh, we were talking uh, before about energy of the um, photon equals to H times F. F is frequency of light, H, H is Planck constant. We did talk about this in photoelectricity effect, etc. So, uh, since we have a, a, a difference between energy levels between, let's say, number 3 and number 2, and then H is a constant that defines the frequency, frequency or uh, uh, wavelengths, these are related. So, he didn't know about that. Now, why is it from 2? I mean, into 2, not, not, not into 1, let's say. What about level number 1, orbit on the first level? Well, the thing is very simple. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the larger amount of uh, energy between different uh, energy between two different layers, the more energy uh, it's supposed to be emitted in the photon, so the photon should have higher frequency, which means lower wavelengths. So the lower wa wavelengths than this would be ultraviolet, and Balmer just didn't see it. So that's why his formula is everything about jumping to level number two. What about jumping from, let's say, number uh, 8 to number 5? No, this formula is not about that. So this is only about jumps to uh, level number 2, which is probably in his particular case was the most prevalent, or I don't know, his experiment, how it was organized. Here comes Rydberg, or Rydberg, Johannes Rydberg, Swedish. Just a couple of years later, after Balmer. And he basically knew these results, but then either his experiments were different or whatever else, but he has come up with a different formula. And the different formula combined not only the level electron jumps from, but also the electron jumps to. So here's his formula. And again, he had a lot of experiments, a lot of data, and then he tried to combine these data into 
some kind of a formula. And you see, considering this formula is about jumping from two, both orbits are involved, most likely he kind of had in mind the orbital structure. Um, and uh, I'm not sure whether it was really like explicitly suggested, but in, in, in this particular case, he probably realized that there are two different positions um, of the atom or electrons within the atom of uh, hydrogen. And these two positions are involved into each other. And he has come up with a slightly different formula, which actually is a generalization of Balmer formula. So the formula which Rydberg came up with is the following. Let's use M here and N here, where N is from and M is 2. So, M is orbit number. Now, let me use this more contemporary um, language to describe this. So, N is the... Uh, m m maybe Reitberg used a different terminology. I'm not really sure. But from our perspective, N is an orbit number where electron comes from and M is the orbit number the electron comes to. Now, you see, this is slightly different than this, but to tell you the truth, it's exactly the same thing. Because if M is equal to 2, so the orbit it comes uh, to is number 2. So what do we have here? 1 over lambda equals R, 1 fourth minus 1 n squared which is r n square minus 4 divided by 4 n square, right? Yes, common denominator. From which lambda is equal to n square divided by n square minus 4, 4 divided by r. So 4 divided by r is b, and n square divided by n square minus 2 is exactly this. So Rydberg formula, which is this one, uh, where Rydberg constant is this one, um, describes a little bit more general case when electrons are jumping from any orbit to any orbit. And again, I'm not sure Rydberg was using exactly this terminology, but I would like you to understand it as this. So this is related directly related to orbital uh, model which uh, generally started by uh, Rutherford I don't remember the dates actually maybe it was at the same time more or less um, and obviously extended by Niels Bohr but that was already beginning of 20th century like 1911 19 13 or something. But anyway, this is the formula which actually somebody like Niels Bohr actually had in his hands. And it described quite well how a hydrogen atom emits light when it's heated or, well, supplied some kind of an energy. Now, will it work for other elements, not hydrogen, like helium, for instance, or a little bit heavier, like metals, for instance, etc. Well, the problem is, this formula is good for hydrogen. Why? Because hydrogen has only one electron. Now, whenever you have a more complicated model, uh, I mean, heavier element with many electrons, there are other much much more important forces which are participating in this. Not much more important, but in addition to 
jumping from one level to another, there are certain other um, energy components which are involved in this process. And that's why the formula is good for one electron only. In a more complex case, we need much more complex things. But for one electron, it's a correct formula for hydrogen. And a true explanation of why this formula is what it is came much later. It came with development of Bohr's model and uh, basically even Bohr himself had to just uh, postulate certain things which he, he did not himself explain. It was explained later on and we will talk about this uh, in the next lecture about Bohr's uh, atom mo model. But in any case, I think you have to view this as a perfect example of how science is actually developing. First you have some numbers, then you have some kind of a formula which generalizes these numbers, then you have a better formula maybe, and only much later you have an explanation of why formula is such and such based on certain, um, well, axioms which people basically accept because, well, it seems reasonable or something like this. I mean, obviously every theory should be explained based on some earlier results, and earlier results based on some even more earlier <laughs> results. It goes to certain axioms which we have to accept without the proof, without an explanation. And we do. And that's if it's correct well, if it corresponds to the reality, to the real nature, if our axioms correspond to reality, then our subsequent theoretical um, uh, derivations would also correspond to reality, to a certain degree, which basically defined by how precise we were with our axioms. So that's the theory um, of uh, well, not the theory, it's basically a practice of uh, Rydberg formula. It, it looks much simpler, by the way, than this one. And uh, quite frankly, to me, it presents less questions. Because why is it foot two square here? I mean, just looking at Balmer's formula, you, you don't realize basically this kind of... Um, I don't know how to say it. It seems to be more natural, all right, I, I, if you wish. So, um, that's what it is. I do suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. It's uh, on unisor.com. So, if you go to Atoms uh, and the Physics, the Physics 14 course, then you go to um, uh, Atoms, and uh, it's uh, building blocks of uh, matter uh, chapter series of lectures. And this lecture is about Rydberg formula. Rydberg or Rydberg, I'm not sure. All right, that's it. Thank you very much, and good luck.